From our exploration of the first element of the armor of God, the belt of truth, I think it is self-evident just how limited our current understanding of the armor of God is and what the armor represents. What I'm trying to share with you is a mature, a deeper spiritual understanding of the kingdom of darkness, its existence, and its function, and your role as a mature believer to oppose it. Unfortunately, based upon the very elementary information that we've heard and accepted regarding spiritual warfare, the furthest we have gotten is man-contrived activities that are not even spoken of in Scripture. As a result, by leaning upon man's proclaimed knowledge and an inaccurate understanding of spiritual matters, these activities have become the centerpiece for how the majority of man's church thinks of and conducts spiritual warfare. Within the confines of man's church, there is nothing being taught about following the example of Jesus, where you do nothing or say nothing unless you first hear or see our Father doing or saying it. Man's church does little to prepare its members for building strength against the enemy, so that over time, not only do they step on the adversary's head, but as part of the larger body of Christ, they destroy all the adversary's works that are within their domains. When properly equipped and following Holy Spirit's lead, it's as if the adversary has no ability to function freely within the domains that you have been given to rule over. That is the goal. The Son of God came and revealed to us His methods to destroy the works of the devil. Paul's admonition at the very end of the book of Romans was for us to be excellent at what is good and for us to be innocent of evil. From what I've seen, man's efforts do not come close to fulfilling these goals as we are limited by our misguided understanding of spiritual warfare and the tools available for us to conduct this warfare. This is the reason that many people hope to maintain some kind of safe haven against the adversary. Many professing Christians talk about the gates of hell coming against them, hoping that they will not be involved in this war. This kind of group thinking is understandable if we acknowledge that most people are biblically illiterate, including a vast majority of preachers and so-called teachers. Unfortunately, most of them are too often biblically illiterate and they're more interested in self-promotion. Therefore, they open themselves and their followers to the lies, the deceptions, and the challenges of the adversary. Paul concludes the book of Ephesians with his reference to the armor of God. He told us that from the beginning, God put everything under Jesus' feet for the church, which is his body. Therefore, our mandate as the church is not merely to survive. Our mandate is not to find safe places or safe havens. Our mandate is not even to make empty gestures that are acted out in man-contrived activities. As we look at time throughout history, it has been proven that there is a hype that is associated with every new rollout of spiritual warfare books and guides. But does anyone ever go back to look and say, is this true? Did it work? Or is it something that's just bogus and a distraction that is consuming our resources, our time, our finances, and our people, while the real war is being lost on practically every front? 
look at the condition of today's church and ask yourself, does this remotely look like victory in any capacity? It is because the church continues to follow illiterate and illegitimate leadership. Because of their great folly and misdirection, man's church has messed things up so badly that its members are wanting to say, beam me up, God. A surprise for most is that contrary to their desires and the information that was taught to them, they're not going to be beamed up. What will happen and what is already happening is that those who have messed it up and those who have accepted the inaccurate teachings are falling away. Some will have their minds transformed, some will be restored, and some will enter into a true relationship with God. But there are groups, especially within Christian media, that have enormously contributed to the propagation of these false gospels. If you look closely, you see that God is not doing much in those venues. But he is doing a lot quietly behind the curtains. That is why we're beginning to hear the truth of God through other lesser known people. Well, who are these people and why haven't we heard about them before? God has kept them hidden until the time was right. It never was about the glitz and the glamour of Christian media, popular conferences, and all the rest of those activities. Those events have become nothing more than personality shows, variety shows, because they're not serious in dealing with the adversary or in dealing with the things that advocate for the kingdom of God. Unfortunately, many of them are just robbing the church to make themselves richer. So let's move on to the second element presented as the armor of God. Remember that our exploration into spiritual warfare is from another, a different perspective than what I have described as the popular presentation of spiritual warfare. Girding your waist with the belt of truth speaks about the renewing of your mind, tying up the deception and lies that have been present since you were in your mother's womb, and arresting the soul from its way of making decisions using truth. You gird your waist with the truth by hearing and heeding Holy Spirit. He is in fellowship with your spirit so that the truth stands up and sustains you. As a reminder, Jesus is the truth. And it is he who stands up and sustains you. Ephesians 6, 14 says, Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. You will notice that Paul uses the word having. So having put on the breastplate of righteousness occurs before you stand. So too is having your waist girded with the belt of truth. Did you notice that? You stand having your waist girded by the truth, having the loins of your mind bound up by the truth, and you have already put on the breastplate of righteousness before standing. Now do you see it? What you have done is you have girded the loins of your mind with the truth, and then you have put on the breastplate of righteousness. But what does that mean? Again, these are analogies to military equipment, common in the days of Paul and commonly known to his audience. Physically, a breastplate has two pieces to it, a front piece and a back piece. The breastplate did not simply hang by straps around the neck. There was a hole in the breastplate that fit over your head, and there was a front portion to the breastplate and a back portion to the breastplate. 
And typically, you could tell something about the rank of the soldier who put on a breastplate. Because the breastplate had on the front portion various insignias, depending upon the rank of the soldier. Now, the back portion matched the front in the sense of the material, the fit, and so on. In war, the importance of the breastplate was that it protected the heart. It protected the vital organs, especially the heart. Because the ancients knew that if something pierced the heart, you were done for. Therefore, underneath the breastplate was the most vital of organs, which was called the heart. Now, I want to bring to your uh, memory that earlier in our exploration of this, Chris had referenced the second mind, which is located in the abdomen. Today, we often refer to this as our gut feeling. Believe it or not, this is also referenced in Scripture, and it has a unique, interesting meaning. Some of you may remember that Scripture uses this word bowels. Bowels that Scripture refers to is also protected by the breastplate of righteousness. If you're not familiar with older idioms, the language may seem weird and not at all clear. The term bowels was used meaning the inner self, much the way that we use heart today. The heart is literally a muscular organ that pumps blood through our bodies. Idiomatically, however, we speak of the heart as the center of our soul. In other words, we use heart today the way that previous generations used bowels. Returning to the insignia on the breastplate, although we are all equal before God, everyone does not have the same responsibility, the same rank in the kingdom of God. In our military, we have insignia that indicates a specific area of training, a specific function of a soldier. This insignia can in indicate whether you're infantry, army, air cavalry, intelligence, and so forth. I want you to know for clarity that insignia indicates that everyone does not have the same measure of rule, the same sphere of rule or influence, or the same responsibility. But whatever the measure of rule that you're given, it must be a rule of righteousness. The heart must be a righteous heart. And it's the breastplate that guards the heart in all of its righteous operations. Sometimes the sphere of your rule, the, the sphere of your responsibility, may be just your own soul, your flesh. Certainly, when you are young and learning the ways of God, you're not given great measures of rule because you're incapable of being responsible for anything more than your own soul. If you do not learn to rule your own soul, God typically will not give you rule over much of anything else due to the unrefined nature of your rule. Now, it's a hard thing to comprehend. Scripture says in Matthew 25, verse 23, His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful and trustworthy over a little. I will put you in charge of many things. Share in the joy of your master. So if you cannot rule your own soul properly, that capacity is the same quality of rule that you will exercise in every domain of rule that you are given. For this reason, God may limit your areas of responsibility, your 
area of rule. In doing this, God is demonstrating his grace because he's keeping his yoke light and easy, keeping you within your capabilities. This quality of rule is apparent. We have watched Mark Zuckerberg develop his rule of Facebook and now Meta. What is the quality of his rule? In the sphere of his rule, what do we know about him? We know that he's driven by money. We also know that despite promises he made about safeguarding people's information and so on, the internal policies of Facebook over the many years of its existence have consistently shown a pattern of profiting and benefiting from the operations of Facebook no matter what promises were made. So what am I trying to say? I'm saying that if you were unskilled in rule, If you have not learned to rule your own soul, your entire outlook is going to reflect that deficiency no matter how large or small your empire may be. Zuckerberg is an example of what happens when young, unseasoned people have such tremendous power to create economies, but they lack fundamental character. Regarding the sphere of one's rule from God, since God is the one handing out measures of spiritual rule, he will never give you any greater rule than what you can handle. He begins with teaching you how to rule your own soul. Then he moves on and begins to teach you how to rule domains that you might be given to rule over. We see this in our own lives. We just don't recognize it. When people get married, their domains increase. A husband's domain and a wife's domain have both increased to involve at least each other. If you have not learned to rule righteously, you may yet be married, but the unrighteous nature of your rule will continue in that domain. Perhaps children come along. If you've not learned how to rule righteously, the sphere of your rule has been expanded. But the quality of your rule will now begin to take on new and ominous permutations, and it will show up in the children of such unprepared rulers. On the other hand, Holy Spirit is faithful to teach you how to rule your own soul. As you begin to understand His teachings and apply yourself to learning, He gives you the help of a spiritual discipler from the house of God and commits you to the rule of a spiritual discipler. This was even true of God's own Son. Jesus was described in Scripture as a righteous man. God committed the oversight of his Son to a righteous man as opposed to an unrighteous man. That's because children who were put under the rule of an unrighteous father, they have a very difficult time. In fact, Scripture speaks to it. Earlier in Ephesians, we can find such things as, and fathers, do not exasperate your children, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. A responsibility of fathers is to train their children in righteousness, both natural fathers and and those who are spiritual disciples. This is a fundamental mandate. 
I want to reference Deuteronomy 10, verses 16 through 20, which speaks of the qualities of righteousness that God insists upon. I want to take this time to remind you that whenever you find in Scripture where God is talking to the nation of Israel, that whatever he is saying directly applies to us because we are grafted into the true nation of Israel. In Deuteronomy 10, 16, the Lord is speaking to Israel. He's speaking to us. And he says this, Therefore, circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. God's saying that although circumcision does relate to a physical act, it also has a spiritual connotation. Even today, it is impossible to have a medical operation to circumcise the heart. What exactly would the surgeon remove? This very question shows that in Scripture, this is intrinsically a spiritual reference. To circumcise the heart is to restrain the soul, to restrain the flesh from contaminating your emotions and your judgments. It is the belt of truth that restrains. This is important because out of the heart flows all the issues of life. Therefore, you are to circumcise the foreskin of your heart and do not be rebellious any longer. That's right. The opposition to righteousness is rebellion. It is rebellion against the standard of divine truth. Rebellion is pushing back against what is true because you prefer to sit down and remain controlled by emotions and you don't want to be disturbed. The breastplate of righteousness repels the emotional response of rebellion. All of us know far too many people who were just children who have grown old. The moment something happens, they erupt in their flesh, and all the years of pew-sitting seems to have made absolutely no change in them. Children who have grown old is the result of people who have refused to restrain the flesh and choose to follow their emotions that have nothing to do with righteousness. They judge things falsely, Because their flesh, their soul, is in the way. They want what they want. The normal three things. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And they reign over the people. This is how people are taken captive. This is what defeat in spiritual warfare looks like. Because you didn't stand. Now, Deuteronomy 10, 17 through 22 continues on by saying that God administers justice for the fatherless, the widows. He loves the stranger and so on. He's speaking about heart. When he speaks of heart, he is speaking about the righteousness of your judgments. We've talked about how God begins by training you as a young person in the ways of righteousness and that all judgments come out of the heart. Therefore, if the heart is unrighteous, the judgment that flows out of the heart is unrighteous. It opposes God and it is rebellion. The main judgment that comes out of an unrighteous heart is rebellion and its self-centeredness. If you choose what is best for you, it's typically short-term. It may enrich you, it may please you, and it may elevate you, but you do not have the power to sustain it over the course of a lifetime. To the point where eventually 
you will be no more than a child that has grown old. An old man or an old woman acting as a child is living in shame and reproach. There is a time in your life when it is okay to be young and to make the mistakes of your youth. But we are called to grow up and to get past that. If you do not, when you are old, you will be a fool in your old age. It does not matter how much money you have. Your behavior will be that of a fool. And it will destroy any legacy that you hope to have otherwise achieved. In spiritual warfare, one of the most effective weapons against the enemy is righteous judgments. Judging things out of a righteous heart. Do you know that the enemy has no weapon that can penetrate a breastplate and strike a heart if the heart underneath the breastplate is righteous? Over time, the glory of such a person will become resplendent and people will see the goodness of God in the face of one whose heart is righteous. This is it the contrast to what we have just been talking about. This is in contrast to a heart of rebellion that nurtures the emotions of youth into old age without change. I want you to listen to Psalm 82. This is the complete Jewish Bible version. Elohim, capital E, God stands in the divine assembly. There with the Elohim, little e, us, his judges, his magistrates. So God stands in the divine assembly with us, and he judges. He's judging us, the Elohim. How long will you go on judging unfairly, favoring the wicked? Give justice to the weak and fatherless. Uphold the rights of the wretched and poor. Rescue the destitute and needy. Deliver them from the power of the wicked. They don't know. They don't understand. They wander about in darkness. Meanwhile, all the foundations of the earth are being undermined. My decree is, you are Elohim. You are the magistrates, the gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, you will die like mortals, like any, any prince you will fall. Rise up. Rise up, Elohim, capital E. Rise up, God, and judge the earth for all the nations are yours. Beginning with the first word to the last verse of this psalm, every reference to the word God is the Hebrew word Elohim. When capitalized, Elohim is capitalized. It's referring to God, our Father. When it's not capitalized, little e in Elohim, it is us. We've already discussed that we are the Elohim of God. In this psalm, we see that God judges in the divine assembly with the Elohim. These Elohim, us, we are called to judge, but their judgment is unjust. He accuses the Elohim of doing the very thing he told Israel not to do. He's pointing the finger at us. He told Israel to defend the poor and fatherless, to do justice to the afflicted and the needy, to deliver the poor and needy, to free them from the hand of the wicked. Are we doing that? The Elohim that he's referring to have an unrighteous heart because 
these Elohim neither know nor understand the importance of righteous judgment. When the hearts of the Elohim are corrupt and wicked, when they are not righteous, when they do not understand, when they walk about in darkness, all of the foundations of the earth are unstable. The human foundations are the foundations upon which human society sits. These foundations are man-made institutional foundations. We find them as foundations of the courts, foundations of governments, of finances, and the list goes on. God is saying human society and the pillars of human society depend upon the integrity of righteous judgments among those who are Elohim, us. Psalms 82 is about the majesty associated with divine judgments. The whole chapter is about judgments and us as the magistrates, the Elohim, making those judgments. The body of Christ carries the standard of God's righteous judgments. He tells us that these standards exist in us. But you're not going to find them in a written codex. Legalism is not what he's talking about regarding righteous judgments. Righteous judgments come out of a righteous heart. How do you know that the judgments that come out of the heart are righteous or unrighteous? It's very simple. Look at the result. When we are representational of the living God in judging matters, then we may be clothed in the divine majesty of representing the Lord. This was the glory that Jesus left us in John 17 when he was talking to the Father and he said, Father, the glory you have given to me, I have given to them. We are clothed in the majesty, the glory, the righteousness that Jesus had when he was here on the earth. But we are only clothed in it when we are exercising judgment according to the standards of divine righteousness. That is why we cannot show partiality in our judgments. What keeps us tied to righteous judgments in our hearts is the fear of the Lord. If we exercise righteous judgments consistent with the fear of the Lord, it does not matter whether people agree or disagree with us. We are the Lord's representatives. Who is subject to divine righteous judgments? Everyone. Because it is God who is sitting enthroned in your heart, who is rendering the judgments. But if you choose to go into situations, having decided what you want, pretending to be enthroned in God's righteousness, you are going nowhere. And even worse, the enemy will put you to rout. What is the condition of the heart in which righteousness normally resides? The heart is pure. If you are restrained by the fear of the Lord, by your relationship, by your love, by your submission, you will pay no attention to your prejudices. You'll pay no attention to the outcomes that you want. And you won't pay attention to the agendas that you wish to advance. Because your relationship with the Lord restrains you in all of your judgments. When that happens, then even Satan is subject to you. Because he is subject to Jesus, who is enthroned in your heart 
when you're speaking out of a righteous heart. Do not give in to the enemy's attempt to lure you into Satan's domain. Understand that Satan cannot judge you. He cannot exert any measure of rule over you, and he does not have personal jurisdiction over you if you are not in his domain. If something you want is not something that is dependent upon Satan, he does not have subject matter jurisdiction over you either. Remember, if you do not have personal or subject matter jurisdiction over an individual, you cannot judge him. That is why Scripture says you are not subject to judgment. It doesn't mean that there's no authority that is over you. No, you are under the authority of Jesus, but he is the one who says you cannot be judged. It's kind of like saying you cannot be condemned because you're not in Satan's domain. Satan does not have the right to rule over you as a son of God. When we wear the breastplate of righteousness, we are doing so to protect our heart, to protect our inner being, to protect our spirit. When we read scripture, we want it to renew our minds and to transform our minds and our hearts. The heart is important because it is what keeps us alive in a physical sense, (coughs) but in a spiritual sense, It is from where all of our desires come. Thus, if our desires are for the Lord and his will, which they will be because it is he who gives us the desires of our heart, then we will make decisions that are good and right. When our heart is protected and pursuing righteousness, then it is easier for us to stand against the challenges Because our desires are not for the flesh. When we are actively pursuing righteousness, thereby putting on the breastplate of righteousness, we are equipped to flee youthful passions. It is his righteousness, not ours, that protects us. God's righteousness is not earned. It is given through exchange. Here's how that exchange works. Jesus takes on our sin, and in exchange for our sin, we receive his righteousness. A wonderful aspect about receiving God's righteousness is that it really doesn't cost you anything, but it costs Jesus everything. One thing you must understand is that God's declaration of righteousness over you is not temporary. It is eternal. It is one of the most important things to know and accept about the righteousness of God. God's justification, his declaration of righteousness over your life has made you right in his sight, both now and forever. That is why in Psalms 23, God presents us to the adversary, declaring us as righteous. One of the more important things to know about the righteousness of God is that it is not something you become. It is something you are.